Hey everyone, I'm Nikki Young and this is Serial Napper, an international true crime podcast. On February 9th, 2004, Maura Murray disappeared after a car accident on Route 112 in Haverville, New Hampshire. The girl, who seemed to have two different sides to her personality, simply vanished into thin air, and her whereabouts remain unknown still to this day, almost 17 years later. This is a mystery that gets talked about a lot. There's been lots of documentaries and podcasts and videos, but we still don't seem to be any closer to finding out what happened to Mora. So tonight, we're going to talk about who Mora was, the events that happened on the day she went missing, and potential theories as to what may have happened. We'll also be talking about this case at the end of the month during our Serial Napper True Crime Discussion Group, so if you're interested in chatting with us about your theories, make sure you join our Facebook group. Just search for Serial Society True Crime Discussion Group on Facebook. I hope to see you there. I'm super excited about tonight's sponsor, and I know you're going to love it as much as I do. Who's tired of looking at fake ads, fake models, and other really lame content on Instagram? I know I am. If you're interested in true crime, urban lore, eerie places, conspiracy theories, and beyond, you need to check out the Instagram account, The Occult Page, all one word. They share fun facts, creepy locations around the world, urban legends, and lots of other stuff that's sure to keep you up at night. Their goal is to create a community for people to explore the weird side of the world and even help people express the things that society may say is weird. Check them out at Instagram.com slash the occult page or check the link in my show notes. Stay tuned halfway through tonight's episode for a sneak peek at some of the awesome content you can find on the occult page Insta account. Okay, let's jump in. Let's start with who Maura Murray was. So she was born on May 4th, 1982 in Brockton, Massachusetts, and she was the youngest daughter of Fred Murray, who was a medical technician, and Laura Murray, a nurse. So she grew up in a middle-class family who was well-educated and with a strong background in the medical field. Unfortunately, as is common, her parents divorced when she was just six years old, but they did keep things friendly. Mora grew up living with her mother in Hanson, which is a small suburb on the south shore of Massachusetts. It has a population of a little over 10,000 people, so not a huge place. There, she grew up with her siblings, including her older brother, Fred Jr., sisters Kathleen and Julie, and younger brother, Curtis. It's been said that Mora was kind of an overachiever. She excelled both academically as a National Honor Society member and she excelled athletically. Actually, she participated in nearly every sport you can think of, including competitive AAU basketball. She was also very active in her local community and those who knew her said she just had that kind heart and she looked like your girl next door with her signature dimples and her beautiful smile. She graduated at the top of her class in high school, which is no surprise, and she pretty much had her pick of colleges. However, she decided to accept congressional nomination from the late Senator Edward Kennedy and joined her sister Julie at the prestigious United States Military Academy at West Point. Whether she really wanted to attend West Point and join the military, or whether she was continuing to try to live up to this persona she had created, Well, we may never know. I want to put a lot of emphasis on how people described her growing up because, as I mentioned, there seem to be two sides to Mora, and the other side of this overachieving young lady was troubled and a bit of a troublemaker. And this other personality began to show itself while Mora was attending West Point. She continued to excel in her academics, and she performed brilliantly on the cross-country and track teams, but it was here that she got herself into a bit of legal trouble. Mora was accused of theft in August 2001 relating to an incident at Fort Knox where she was caught stealing about $5 worth of makeup from the commissary. An honor investigative hearing was convened, and Mora pled guilty. 
They were to make a decision as to what would happen to Mora by the end of January 2002, but Mora kind of cut that off and officially withdrew from West Point on January 2nd, 2002. It would later come out that she was out of class seven times in 2001 to appear before the honor board. Her parents had no idea that she was having this trouble because she had signed documents that kept medical information and disciplinary news from her parents. Her roommate at West Point named Megan Sawyer would later say about Mora, you could tell there were some inner demons. She seemed sad. If she wanted to make up another life, she could do it. If she wanted to disappear, she could. I believe she's alive. It's just a feeling I've always had. While her bad behavior seemed to begin while she was at West Point, it wouldn't end there. After withdrawing from West Point, she transferred to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where she decided to pursue a career in nursing. During this time in November 2003, Three months before her disappearance, Mora admitted to using a stolen credit card to order food from several restaurants. She later said that she pulled the credit card number off of a receipt that she found in a trash can and she used that to order a bunch of food. I also want to mention that she had ordered way more food than one person could ever eat And it was rumored that she did at some point have an eating disorder and was bulimic. I don't say this to tarnish her name in any way, but rather to give you a little bit of insight into what kind of issues she may have been hiding and facing. Again, this is just a rumor and it was never confirmed. Now, I've read a couple of different versions regarding what happened to her as a result of this theft. Some sources say that she received what amounted to a slap on the wrist and didn't really face any real consequences. Other sources say that charges were brought about, but they were dismissed after three months for good behavior. Now, in the days leading up to her disappearance, some kind of, we'll say, odd things happened. And all of these put together creates a real mystery as to what may have really happened to Mora. On the evening of February 5th, 2004, Mora was working a shift at her campus security job, which was basically in the building next to her dorm room. Her job was to help staff the front check-in desk for students getting in and out of the dorms. Now this night begins with a flurry of cell phone activity. At around 7.17 p.m., Mora makes a 20-minute call to her boyfriend, Billy Rausch. She had met Billy while she was at West Point, and the two were in a seemingly complicated long-distance relationship. She called Billy again at 9.56 p.m. for about six minutes. Mora was also on the phone a lot with her older sister Kathleen that night, and she was acting really strange. She seemed really down, really depressed, and just sort of out of it. She actually talked to her sister for about 28 minutes. Around 10.30 p.m., while still on her shift, Mora reportedly broke down in tears. When her supervisor asked what was wrong, she said two words only, my sister. She wouldn't elaborate any further on what she meant by that, but it would later come out that the sisters were talking about Kathleen's relationship problems with her fiance. Kathleen was a recovering alcoholic. She had been discharged from a rehab clinic that evening, and on the way home, her fiance took her to a liquor store, which caused an emotional breakdown. Mora was trying to support her and was apparently having a really hard time. It quickly became apparent that Mora was not going to be able to continue working her shift that night. Her supervisor noted that she was just completely zoned out. No reaction at all. She was unresponsive, just staring out into space. So the supervisor decided to escort Mora back to her dorm room around 1.20 a.m., The supervisor asked if she wanted her to come up to her dorm so that they could talk about what was going on, and Mora said no, it would be fine because her roommate was there. This was actually a lie. Mora didn't have a roommate, so obviously she just wanted to be left alone. Two days later on February 7th, 2004, her father Fred drives up to meet up with Mora to help her to look for a new car. 
At the time, Mora was driving an older 1996 Saturn, and apparently it had been giving her trouble. So her father was going to help her to get a new one. The car she was driving, it was only eight years old at the time. And with Mora living on campus and working really close to the campus, it seems a little bit strange to me that she needed a new car, but I don't know. So Fred, he picks up Mora and they go car shopping. Everything seemed fine. Around 9 p.m. that night, Mora and Fred go to pick up Mora's friend Kate, and the trio goes back to the Amherst Brewing Company for dinner and drinks. One odd thing to point out here, during dinner, neither Mora or her father mention going car shopping, which is kind of strange considering that's how they spent most of their day, and that was the whole reason he was in town. And later, none of her friends would report ever hearing about Mora needing a new car or that she would be car shopping. Maybe it means nothing at all, but I just wanted to point it out. So after dinner and before Mora and Kate drop Fred off at the Quality Inn where Fred was staying for the night, they decide to stop at a liquor store. Mora and Kate, they go in to shop for drinks. They would be going to a party later that evening on campus, so they stock up. Now, what happens next is crazy to me. The girls get back in the car with bags full of liquor, and somehow Mora convinces her father to allow her to borrow his brand new car that he's driving around in so that she can take it to the party, knowing that she has liquor and will be drinking. So the girls drop Fred off at the Quality Inn before taking this new car to the party. And I'm just like, wh what? My only theory is this one. Mora's parents are divorced. She grew up living with her mother, so maybe her father spoiled her a little bit extra since he didn't see her as often. Maybe he gave in to her more than he should have because he had a little bit of guilt for not being in her life more. That would definitely explain him driving up and getting her a new car when she probably didn't need one. And I guess it could explain this, but man, what a terrible decision. Giving your daughter the keys to your car when you know she's going to be drinking. So Mora and Kate, they take Fred's car and go to Sarah Alfieri's dorm room where the party was happening. Sarah, who worked with Mora at her second job at an art gallery on campus, that's how they knew each other. Both Kate and Sarah would later be questioned about the party, what happened at the party, and who was at the party, but both of them seemed to remember very little about anything to do with the party. They didn't know the names of who was there, they didn't remember much of what happened at the party, which of course could all be attributed to the fact that they were drinking. Both Mora and Kate left the party around 2.30 a.m., supposedly to go return Fred's car. Both were walked out of the party by an unknown male. Later, Sarah would contradict this statement, saying that Mora left the party alone, but none of this would ever be confirmed. We do know that an hour after leaving the party, Mora got into her father's car alone, and at 3.33 a.m. early Sunday morning, she gets into a car crash. The crash is serious enough to have reportedly caused $8,000 in damage, so much damage that the vehicle was considered totaled by the insurance company. I have no idea how, but Mora isn't arrested or charged with any crime. The girl must have had a horseshoe up her butt, or maybe she decided not to drink much at the party. I'm not sure. But the car was towed by AAA at 429 a.m. with Mora hitching a ride with the tow truck driver over to the Quality Inn. She arrived at the Quality Inn at around 445 a.m. and spends the rest of the night slash morning in her father's motel room. Her father Fred apparently hadn't woken up when Mora somehow got into his room. And most are unsure how Mora actually got into the motel room without a key. At 538 a.m. though, Mora calls her boyfriend, Billy, and she uses her father's phone. I'm guessing because her phone battery was probably dead and she likely didn't have the charging cable with her. Billy would say that she was crying, she was upset about the accident, but he assured her that it would all be fine and the two hung up and agreed to talk in the morning. 
The following morning, Fred wakes up to find his daughter in his hotel room, and Mora tells him that she has totaled his brand new car. Mora tells her father that she went around the corner, she hit some sand, and she skidded. She said she hadn't had anything to drink in a while, and she was never given a breathalyzer or a ticket. Fred would later say that he wasn't mad at Mora, more so thankful that she was okay. I don't know how true that is. I mean, I'd be pretty pissed off if I was her father, but I wouldn't have given her my car in the first place, so who's to say? The Occult Page Instagram account is a must follow for those of you who love all things spooky, true crime, creepy, eerie, and beyond. It's a great place to catch interesting little factoids about some of your favorite topics. Like, did you know that bamboo torture is a real thing? This torture method was used by the Japanese soldiers in World War II. Their victims were forced to lay on this sharp bamboo until it basically pierced them. Remind me next time to steer clear of the police force here. They still carry around these giant bamboo sticks, although they're supposedly for decoration at this point, but I don't know. Either way, follow the Occult Page Instagram account for more goodies like this one. That's Instagram.com slash the Occult Page. Now back to our story. So now we are on to the next day, which is February 9th. And this is all after Mora's had her accident and she's back in her dorm room. So in the early hours of the day, Mora uses her computer to make several questionable internet searches. Two were for driving directions to the Berkshire and Burlington. And the other search was about the effects of excessive drinking on an unborn baby. Mora may have thought she was pregnant, although no one in her life has confirmed if that was actually true or not. Mora emails all of her professors and she emails her work supervisor to inform them that there had been a death in the family and she would be gone for a week. This was a lie. There was no death in the family. Billy, her boyfriend, begins calling her relentlessly and Mora pretty much just ignores his phone calls altogether. Her father also tries to reach out to her to let her know that he had spoken to his car insurance and it was all okay. They were going to cover it, but he needed her to come by to sign some paperwork. Now, the first reported contact that Mora has with anyone on that day, on February 9th, it's at 1 p.m. when she emails her boyfriend. The email says, I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promise to call today, though. Love you, Mora. Mora also places a call to the owner of a condominium in Bartlett, New Hampshire, which is a place that was very special to Mora because she had spent a lot of time growing up there. Telephone records indicate that the call lasted only three minutes, and in the end, the owner didn't actually go through with renting the condo to Mora. Now at 2.05 p.m., Mora calls a number which provides recorded information about booking hotels in Stowe, Vermont. The call lasts approximately five minutes. Apparently, their telephone system is down at the time, so she doesn't actually speak to a person. She just listens to some pre-recorded messages. At 2.18 p.m., she telephones her boyfriend and gets his voicemail, so she leaves him a voice message promising him that they would talk later. This call ended after one minute. Immediately after, Billy makes three return phone calls to Mora, three, four, and six minutes later, all of which go unanswered. Now, apparently he had missed this phone call that Mora placed because he was on the phone with one of her other friends asking what the heck was going on with her. After all of this, Mora packed up her dorm room. When her room was searched later, campus police discovered most of her belongings packed in boxes and all of the artwork removed from the walls. Now, on top of these packed boxes was something kind of strange. There was a printed out email regarding a possible relationship problem with Billy. Apparently, there had been some infidelity in the past on his part, and that's exactly what the email was about. I couldn't find the content of the email anywhere, but why would she print this and leave it out? 
To me, it seems the email must have been left out for someone to find, but who and why? Mora also packed a bag to bring with her. She packed a bag with toiletries, makeup, workout clothes, school books, her birth control, and a bit of clothing for her to wear. Mora then drives to an ATM and withdraws $280, which is basically all that she has in her bank account at the time. There is video footage of her withdrawing this money at the machine. She is all by herself and she does appear to be fine. She doesn't look like she's in distress or anything like that. Then Mora goes to the liquor store and she spends $40 on Bailey's, Kahlua, vodka, and a box of red wine. Additionally, she stops at the Amherst DMV to pick up the insurance paperwork for her father's car. So she did remember to do that. She places a call to her own voicemail at 4.37 p.m. Then she packs up her car, the one that she supposedly needed replaced because it wasn't working well, and she leaves on her trip, a very mysterious trip. To date, there's no indication that she had informed anyone of where she was going, and there's no evidence to show that she had chosen one specific location, but she was heading to New Hampshire. Now, sometime after 7 p.m. that night, a Woodsville, New Hampshire resident hears a loud thump outside of her house. She goes to look out her window to see what the noise was, and she sees a car up against a snowbank. So she telephones the Grafton County Sheriff's Department at approximately 7.27 p.m. to report the accident. According to the 911 log, the woman claims to have seen a man smoking a cigarette inside the car that's been involved with the accident. However, she later stated that she had not seen a man nor a person smoking a cigarette, but rather she had seen what appeared to be a red light glowing from inside the car, which was potentially from a cell phone. At around the same time, there is another neighbor in the area who sees the car as well, and they report seeing someone walking around the vehicle. The car, of course, would later be confirmed to be Mora's car, and it's unclear whether she was alone in the car or whether someone was in the car with her. There's been conflicting reports and stories, so like we just don't really know. Now, a school bus driver by the name of Butch Atwood, who was returning home from his shift, stopped by the car accident to see if he could help. There, he found Mora, who wasn't bleeding or visibly injured, though the airbags had deployed. She did, however, appear to be really cold and she was shivering. I mean, it was February after all. And he reported that she also appeared that she could have been intoxicated. He offers to telephone for help, but Mora asks him not to call the police and she assures him that she's already called AAA. Later, AAA would have no record of any such call and knowing that there was no cell reception in the area, Butch knew that she couldn't have called, and so he went home and called police himself. Which, I mean, I would have done too. The car was in bad shape, and Mora did appear to be intoxicated, in his opinion. Now, Butch's call was received by the Sheriff's Department at around 7.43 p.m., so about 20 minutes after they received the first report of the accident. At around 7.46 p.m., police would arrive at the scene. At that time, no one was found inside or around the car. Mora was just gone. The car had impacted the tree on the driver's side of the vehicle, severely damaging the left headlight and pushing the car's radiator into the fan. The car's windshield was cracked on the driver's side. If you look at pictures, it almost looks like somebody threw a giant rock on it. Both airbags had been deployed and the car was locked. There was a box of red wine behind the driver's seat, as well as stains on the ceiling and the door that were red, that red liquid. There was also an empty Coke bottle that appeared to have a little bit of red liquid in it too. So it did appear that she was probably drinking the red wine out of the Coke bottle. The officer also noted that there did appear to be a rag stuffed in Mora's tailpipe, but later it was learned that this was something that her dad, Fred, had told her to do in order to avoid being ticketed by police for the excessive smoke coming out of the tailpipe. Those other bottles of alcohol that Mora had purchased earlier, the vodka, the Baileys, they were nowhere to be found, so it's assumed that wherever she went to, she brought them with her. 
They did find a AAA card issued to Maura Murray. They also found that blank accident report form for her dad's car. They found her gloves, compact discs, makeup, diamond jewelry, driving directions to Burlington, Vermont, Maura's favorite stuffed animal that she didn't leave to go anywhere without, and a book called Not Without Peril, which was about mountain climbing in the White Mountains. Missing were Maura's debit card, her credit cards, and her cell phone, none of which has ever been located or used since her disappearance. They did a quick initial search for Maura in the immediate area, but they found nothing. And the investigation and search for Maura wouldn't fully be implemented until 36 hours after the crash. The search covered a 20-mile area along Route 112, and not a single footprint was found in the snow. At 12.36 p.m. the following day, which was February 10th, a B on the lookout report for Mora was issued. She was reported as wearing a dark coat, jeans, and a black backpack. Police also left a voicemail on Fred Murray's home answering machine at around 3.20 p.m., stating that her car had been found abandoned. Police then utilized dogs to try and track her scent. They lost more scent about 100 feet from the accident in the middle of the road, which to them suggests that Maura either hitchhiked, she kept walking, or she was abducted. Maura had seemingly vanished into thin air within 10 minutes of speaking to the bus driver and him calling the police. She has never been seen or heard from since this moment. So, what the hell happened to Mora? This story is insane with so many weird circumstances leading up to her disappearance. So let's talk about potential theories. Theory number one is that she went into the mountains to commit suicide. When I first heard the details of this case, that was initially my first thought. She was packing up all her belongings in her dorm. She left out that old email about Billy cheating on her for someone to find. I mean, maybe it was a final fuck you to Billy. I don't know. It's clear that she was battling a lot of internal demons. She was drinking a lot. She was getting into legal trouble. She had just crashed her dad's car and then she just crashed this car too. She may have been pregnant and struggling to come to terms with the idea. Her whole image of being this academic and athletic all-star may have come crashing down around her. And it seems that initially her father, Fred, thought that this could be exactly what happened to her. Lieutenant John Skirinza, who is now retired but a former lead investigator into Morris's disappearance, said, What I was told was the first thing out of Fred's mouth was, she has gone to the North Country to commit suicide. Since then, Fred has changed his mind, and it seems that his theory is now that someone abducted Mora. But if she did commit suicide, where did she go? It was freezing cold that day. She couldn't have gotten too far out in those elements, and it was snowing. If she did want to go off and commit suicide, why has her body never been found? Theory number two is that she died of exposure to the elements. She could have been really disoriented. She was maybe intoxicated, although that hasn't been confirmed. And since her cell phone didn't have reception where the crash happened, perhaps she thought she would walk to get help. Unfortunately, not realizing just how cold it was. Shortly after the accident on February 9th, a witness claimed to have seen Mora walking several miles from the crash site. Maybe she simply collapsed somewhere. She could have also ran into the woods to avoid the authorities. Then maybe she got lost and died of exposure. The area where she disappeared from is really desolate. It's surrounded by woods. The route is really dark and someone unfamiliar with the terrain and area could easily become lost. But again, you have to ask the question like, where is her body? Theory number three is that Mora was abducted by an opportunistic killer. Some people believe that someone snatched Mora in the mere minutes between when Butch Atwood last laid eyes on her and when she disappeared. Some even believe that maybe it was Butch himself who knew that there was no cell phone coverage in the area. But we don't know. I mean, he's never been named a suspect, so we just don't know. The theory goes that a vehicle stopped in the middle of the road under the guise of offering more help. Then the person, or maybe persons, dragged her into the car and drove off quickly before anyone noticed. 
But with this theory, literally everything would have had to happen so fast and so perfectly because like I said, there was only about 10 minutes between the time that Mora was last seen and when the police showed up at her vehicle. This theory hinges on the fact that the scent dogs that were used lost Mora's scent in the middle of the road, not far from where she crashed her car. Still, to this day, there haven't been any legitimate suspects named in her disappearance. Theory number four is that she started a new life in Canada. Now, to me, this is the least likely of possible theories, but it's one that some people honestly do believe to be true. The theory is that someone met Mora to pick her up to take her to Canada so that she could start a new life. Maybe they were even following closely behind her in another car and she just jumped in with them. That's how she was picked up so quickly. Maybe the car crash was staged and the whole thing was planned out. But hell, it would have taken a whole lot of secretive planning for this to have worked. Some say that Mora is alive and well, living in Quebec, and her family is very much aware of it. However, to me, it seems really unlikely that Mora's father would insist his daughter was abducted if he knew where she really was. Because like I said, Fred has continued to this day to push for finding out what happened to Mora, and he firmly believes that someone has taken her. Also, there's never been a credible sighting of Mora in Canada, and she's never touched her bank accounts. So what are the latest updates in this case? Well, in February 2019, Fred Murray reiterated his belief that he believes his daughter was dead, as well as his suspicions about a nearby house that cadaver dogs responded to. So this basically plays into the theory that someone abducted her, but there was a house located nearby and the idea, the thought, the theory was that someone dragged her to this house and killed her. And at one point they did bring in cadaver dogs and a cadaver dog did apparently pick up on a scent of a decomposed body. And so he stated, that's my daughter, I do believe. In early April 2019, excavation was done within the basement of the house. Fred Murray had previously wanted to search the home, but the owners at the time didn't cooperate. The property did, however, go up for sale, and its new owners allowed several searches of the property. So, an excavation was conducted, but found absolutely nothing, other than what appeared to be a piece of pottery or old piping. So, unfortunately, another dead end there. Last year, the Murray family launched a new website, which has a ton of information and photos of Mora. You can check that out at moramurraymissing.org. But if you're really interested in learning all about Mora's case, I highly recommend checking out the website, the107degree.com. It has so much detail. It's got transcripts, police reports, you name it. There's so many details to this case. I've just done a rather quick overview with as much information as I can possibly think to put in there. But there are so many other details that I just couldn't fit in this story. There's theories and guesses and witness statements and testimonies and links and oh my gosh, I I just have no idea. But there, there's a lot. So check out those links that I stated if you're really interested in diving more into this story. We'll also be talking about this case at the end of this month during our Serial Napper True Crime discussion. So if you're interested in chatting with us about your theories, I want to hear it. Make sure you join our Facebook group. Just search for Serial Society True Crime Discussion Group. I really hope to see you there. All right, that's it for tonight's story. I want to once again thank tonight's sponsor. Make sure you go check out the Instagram account, The Occult Page, all one word. If you're interested in true crime, urban lore, eerie places, conspiracy theories, and beyond, I'm telling you, you're going to love it. And if you want to reach out to me, you can find me on Facebook at Serial Napper. You can also search for me on Apple or Spotify. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper, or I'm on YouTube, Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.